Um, we are having a Zoom meeting tonight, um, so I just want to read the uh, Bible that allows us to do this. So, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, dated June 16, 2021, an act relative to extending certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state emergency regarding suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law Chapter 30A, Subsection 18. The town of Situate Joint Select Board and Shellfish Advisory Committee meetings be conducted both in person and via remote participation. The conferencing application Zoom, for which credentials are, uh, are provided below, will be used for this purpose. An online link and telephone access number will be provided on all meeting agendas and also on the board's website. Every effort will be made to ensure that members and the public can adequately access the proceedings to the best of our technical ability, despite our best efforts, this meeting may be viewed as a video recording on Citrus Community Television, website, YouTube, and a transcript for other comprehensive records of the meeting will be available as soon as possession after the meeting. Please note that while our option for remote attendance and our participation is provided as a courtesy of the public, the meeting slash hearing will not be suspended or terminated if technology problems interrupt the virtual broadcast unless required by law. If participating remotely, you must have a microphone or you not be able to speak, and you must have a camera if you want to see the video. Um, if dialing in the phone, please use pound six to mute and unmute. And um, the um, URL and all the information stuff has been posted. The phone number, I'll give it real quick in case people are watching. Um, uh, 1646 931 3860. If you're trying to dial it. Great. Um, I'd also like to make one other comment. Actually, let me call the meeting to order and have the acceptance of the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. Second by Mr. Goodrich. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It is unanimous 5 0. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Do you want to call your meeting sure. as well? Can we call the meeting to order? Moved by second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Um, the select uh, situate select board of the selfish advisory encourage an environment of respect during meetings and encourage all members to interact in a polite manner, even when there is disagreement. We value the participation of our community and we want all participants including marginalized and minoritized communities to feel welcome and respected. We urge our committee members and all who participate to commit to these standards, to support and respect our community, and to participate in an orderly and peaceful manner. <coughs> okay. Said, um, I'm going to open it up to walk-ins uh, before, before I get in, I'll kind of lay out how the meeting's going to go. Are there any walk-ins on any topic that, has, that does not have to do with shellfish. Because we're going to be testing shellfish and that will occur during that meeting. Yes, sir, name and address? William Graham, 14 Children Ave. And I would like to um, request that the meeting be indefinitely postponed due to the fact that the Attorney General is reviewing the Cohasset bylaw and has not made a decision on it yet. I understand the decision will be made in mid-April, and I think that it would be prudent for the town to wait till that decision comes out. Uh, otherwise, if you proceed now, I'm sure we're going to get into legal um, expenses with the town of Cohasset and the proponents uh, of the opposition. Thank you. Um, so, Bill, we talked about that prior. So, a, a brief history. So, we voted probably a month ago um, on whether we wanted to proceed with the whole shell fishing process. We brought up that topic about waiting until this uh, hearing came through and the board voted four to one to proceed. So we did talk about that, we discussed it. And at this point in time, unless anyone's changed their mind on that, um, and I'm seeing shaking heads, we're gonna proceed as, as we go ahead that prior. Okay. Any other Watkins? Great. Okay, so let me start out with a, a, a quick comment and then we'll get into um, 
the presentation and, and um, uh, ultimately the uh, interviews of the applicants. Um, I would do want to bring to everybody's attention that we did receive two letters from the attorney from the attorney for friends of Basin Beach that were questioning whether um, all abutters were notified of this meeting properly. Um, and I will, we brought that information to town, our town council. We spoke with them. We spoke with our assessor. And to the best of our knowledge and to the best of the data that we have at our assessor's office, we have notified everybody that we feel is within 500 feet of the, of the area. Um, if anybody here has an actual survey plot of land that they own that they feel is within 500 feet of that area, we will take a look at that right now and um, see if we want to, if that changes our decision, if they feel that they have not been notified properly. Ma'am, I'll get you in one second. Um, other, other than that, <clears throat> we've uh, vetted this out and our assessor has looked at our records and we feel that we have notified everybody in the proper manner. Yes, ma'am, do you have a survey document? So we're not taking comments right now, okay. um, but you will have an opportunity to talk at some point in time. But if anybody... No, you would, actually, you would actually have to bring in a survey of your land that shows where you own property that was within 500 feet of, of the area that we're talking about today. Okay. And if you don't have that document, if you do have it, you know, at a, at a future date, okay. then we will go through the process of allowing you to um, have whatever time you need to prepare for the meeting and we'll, we'll reconvene at that point in time. Okay, well, I have to set the blaze. Not one person can delay the notification. Okay. The blaze is the largest uh, May I, I'm just all I'm doing right now, and I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm trying to. Yeah, so, yeah, so we have notified everybody properly that is within 500 feet of that, that area per our records in the assessor's office. If anybody has a survey document that shows otherwise, then I'll look at it right now. If you don't, then, um, then we're going to proceed. If you find one later, then we'll go through that process then. But could I just ask a question? I've done with uh, Ohasset. Did you notify anybody? Yes. Any, anybody? There were people that you you found were within 500 feet and you notified them? Oh no, there was no one, I'm sorry, there was no one within 500 feet of the area that we're talking about. So you, you didn't notify anybody? Um, we, well, we did the, we had in the None of the abutters. None of, there's no abutters that we're aware of that are within 500 feet of that property. And, and shouldn't we have been told in advance to bring documentation if that's what it's going to take. Um, well, this letter just came to us recently, and um, I that's guess the whole that's the whole idea for letting people know in advance about. What's well, going you did know in advance. You 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 knew that there was a letter. It was publicly notified. It was in the paper. Um, many many people know. Many people wrote letters, commented to the paper. So this this wasn't done behind. There was purpose. nothing about bringing documentation. Well, that, the only reason we would, if you had documentation. The only thing that we would do is take this technicality that, that the attorney wrote and say that you weren't notified properly. What we feel right now is that we have notified everybody properly. So if we do bring forward documentation that shows that we are within 500 feet, whatever happens tonight is voided. Well, it's not voided because we're going to proceed tonight. But what we would do is we would give you whatever time you needed, two weeks to prepare, whatever you needed, and then we would reconvene and we would see if your if your information changed any of our opinions. And I'll just look at town council. Is that proper? Yes, that's right. Thank you. Any other? Uh, yeah. Did you give your address, sir? I'm sorry. One sixty six Bond Street. I also own property out in Glass I'm sorry. What was the street? 166 Pond Street. Okay. So that being said, what we're going to do, the way we're going to handle this is we're going to have a uh, presentation from the Shellfish Advisory Committee. Um, then what I'm going to do is we're going to talk um, for a little bit. We're going to, uh, people have the opportunity to talk about shellfishing in general for a short period of time. After that period of time, we're going to talk to three applicants. And the, there'll be discussion at that after that time only on the applicants. Okay, because what we're doing now is assessing whether we feel the applicants warrant the ability to get the license to show. So there'll be two opportunities to speak.
The first one will be about shell fishing for a short period of time. Then after that, it'll be applicant driven. Okay. Does anyone on the board have any comments before we proceed? No. Okay. Susan, do you want to? Um, do we accept the agenda? Yes. Andrew, second. Yes. Sorry, sorry. Okay. So, Susan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yep. You can do your presentation. I share screen. And I'll tell you what, uh, no, go ahead. Oh, wait. Sorry, I can wait. No, that's fine. Aquaculture Farming Institute, which I know many of you have been to these meetings, but I thought it would be a good time to just level set where we've been and where we are. Um, briefly discuss aquaculture farming, and then briefly discuss where the three acre proposed sites are, and then briefly discuss um, how the Shellfish Constable will manage and enforce the um, this endeavor. Okay, so as far as the timeline, in 2019, the Town of Situate Slide Board formed the Shellfish Advisory Committee and charged them with exploring potential aquaculture farm locations within Situate Waters. And if feasible, in conjunction with DMF, Division of Maine Fisheries, create regulations to license and oversee these farms. The Select Board directed the Shellfish Advisory Committee to identify a small scale site that would be out of recreational areas and would coexist with current uses. The proposal was for a potential of eight one acre inner tidal plots. As a reminder, inner tidal is between the mean low tide and mean high tide line. The Shellfish Advisory Committee identified potential sites that met the criteria for aquaculture, including absence of eelgrass, absence of significant amounts of recreational shellfish. Additionally, the 2019 proposal location of farms took into consideration existing recreational uses of inner tidal flats area and subtitled area beyond the mean low tide. In 2019, 18 <coughs> public meetings were held to discuss the development of aquaculture program in Situate, including a large forum on September 4th, 2019 to review proposed regulations and two meetings with Cohasset officials and residents. The Shellfish Advisory Committee received embedded nine applications for the proposed sites and sent them to the select board. Prior to the select board holding a meeting, public hearing in 2019 to grant preliminary approval of aquaculture sites, the Friends of Bassing Beach brought a lawsuit against the town and the nine applicants. While the matter continued, the Citrus Select Board directed the Shellfish Advisory Committee to explore feasibility of deeper water, subtitle, so that's beyond the mean low tide out toward the, toward the ocean waters within North Sidgwick. From 2020 to 2021, the Shellfish Advisory Committee identified potential deep water sites and held 16 additional public meetings to review findings. Students from the Cohasset Center for Student Coastal Research participated by helping map eelgrass locations. The data was overlaid by a certified mean low tide watermark by Merrill engineers to ensure that the proposed sites were in fact in subtitle areas and adhered to the Massachusetts Marine Fisheries requirements. In 2022, the revised locations were proposed to the select board. DMF conducted a preliminary survey of the locations. The original <coughs> nine applicants were con contacted and four responded that they remained interested in starting farms and pursuing licenses in the new location. Since then, one applicant has withdrawn. The regulation and enforcement of aquaculture farms is a state and local partnership. The farms are preliminarily approved through a public hearing at the local level, the select, select board, and then final approval will be a hearing, a DMF site survey after the local approval. We are here today to hold a public hearing for granting preliminary approval for free applications, three one acre plots, three businesses, um, three 
what, three of one acre small businesses um, on the subtitle Waters of Bassing Beach in North Central. I do want to pause here a moment to thank everyone involved in this five year effort um, to bring new small business to our fishing community, including the seven select board members over the past five years who have had the vision to initiate and support these important new initiatives in our town. We have also had nine shellfish advisory committee members of five years who have dedicated their time. Our committee is a group of resilient and dedicated individuals who are passionate about the water, recreation, and commercial fishing. We are fortunate to have equally dedicated elected officials, town employees, residents, local fishermen, recreational boaters, students, community members, scientists, teachers, and neighboring community residents who have actively participated over the past five years to push us as a committee to examine all angles of policies and procedures. The Shellfish Advisory Committee is enthusiastically supporting the preliminary approval of these three applicants, and we are excited to continue to support aquaculture farming in situate. As a committee, we voted unanimously to move the applications forward to the select board. Okay, so briefly, what is aquaculture farming? It is the farming of aquatic animals. In this case, oysters for food. So all of the applicants have applied to to harvest oysters. As we know, the shellfish industry is important culturally and economically in situate and in Massachusetts for centuries. Massachusetts remains one of the top states for commercial shellfish landings. The top, these are top two, top species are include, uh, include oysters. The EMF reports that Eastern oyster land, landings in Massachusetts have increased significantly over the past 10 years. Most oyster landings in Massachusetts come from small scale aquaculture farms. For reference, DMF has been <coughs> issued permits to 395 private aquaculture license holders across nearly 30 coastal municipalities. So aquaculture, while new to situate as a small business, is not at all new to Massachusetts. Aquaculture is an important addition to the blue economy in Massachusetts and will be an important addition to Situate's blue economy. Aquaculture has allowed coastal town fishing communities like Situate opportunities to diversify <coughs> and remain competitive. All three applicants intended to grow Eastern oysters using off bottom grow out methods where oysters are suspended off the subtitle floor in bags similar to these pictured, a uh, rack and bag method. <coughs> These methods are suitable for subtitle areas in Briggs Harbor and North Citrus waters off of Bassing Beach. Per our regulations, rack and bags cannot be more than 18 inches off the floor. Note that these would be underwater and only partially seen at very low tide, but we gave you this picture so that you could actually see what they were. A quick review of the sites. So most of you have seen this presentation as far as if you've listened to the select board, as far as the aquaculture, where we've done the proposed sites. Um, I just want to walk quickly through the proposal um, in North Citric. I do want to note all the maps are from MA Shellfast viewer mapping tool, which is a GIS mapping tool. I have the web address here. It's a great public resource. It's available to anyone who wants to go in and do some fun mapping. So a um, little public service for the great tools that we have in Massachusetts. Okay, so here we go. As far as the sites, just to orient you, um, this, so we've got Bassings Beach here, got the jetty here, Cohasset Harbor coming in here, the channel coming out this way, back here, you know, Bassing Beach, we've got the um, little river that goes back to the Minot parking lot, and then Glades is up here. Um, so these are the um, these are the two sites that we mapped out with with DMF. Regarding how large the, the land is out here, the acreage of water, there's 320 plus acres of Situate and Cohasset waters, um, and that again, this is that fun mapping tool that you could all use, um, and the the line, this is the, the green is the town line, the Citrate Cohasset line. So um, again, the majority of the acreage, 200 plus acres are Citrate waters out here um, in the in here. 
And then another important thing to note is MB10 in situ. So um, as far as open waters and closed waters. So the waters on this side of the line, this blue line are open to shellfishing. So recreational shellfish as well as, um, as so recreational shellfish and would be for com commercial shellfish is conditionally open. Over here, it's closed. And the line is based on testing. So Mike, our shellfish constable has been testing with DMF for years and years and years out here. Um, and these are based on test results as well as flow flow results from Cohasset treatment. And those are also actually, we, great point, Mike, we post every single one of our, <laughs> of our um, test results and we've gone back years and posted that. We'll probably crash the website at some point with so much data. Um, and here we've got um, within the MB10 open acres, there's 200 plus acres of shellfishable waters um, in, um, in situate waters here. And then this um, just is a, I talk about what we did before we did the, this is kind of zooming in. So if you go back, it's the same, same little um, um, uh, areas here, the two five acres. We, this was historic grass was the green. The mean low tide mark is here. So we're, we're this side of the mean low tide mark. The um, blue um, are the preliminary eelgrass surveys. So um, unfortunately, we were staying out of the eelgrass anyway, but um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of eelgrass out there um, anymore. Um, so all these blue lines are evidence of no eelgrass when we did our surveys. And then again, this was posted online. These are the coordinates. And back to, this is back to where we are. So how do we get from there to where we are now with three acres? We, um, we had three people apply and none of them applied to this area. So this one, I guess it would be closest to Glade. So this um, is eliminated. And then what we did was we made three acres out of here. So you're gonna notice it's a little bit of a different kind of cut off that pit to make three acres. So next here are the three acre plots. There's um, an orange one, orange dotted line, and that's Jamie Davenport and um, Greg Wallingford. The purple dotted line, that's Mike Cotter, and Larry Trowbridge is the, um, the red uh, dotted line here. So that is what we're here today to discuss. So again, it's a shrunken footprint from the last time we went through this, but I wanted to walk through how we got to it. I know it was it took a little bit of time, but I hope it helps there. And then quickly, how will we... Um, manage um, aquaculture farming that has come up in the past. So I'd like to more quickly talk about that. Thank you, good evening. Thank you. So as far as the markings, we did mark the area once and I was told the blue somehow vanished away, even though they were still whale safe and not in the world, you know, the whale area. But uh, the area, the town would be responsible for putting four corner points around the perimeter of the uh, aquaculture area, which we'll do. Um, as far as inspections, we'll go out there by boat, um, be in constant contact with the three growers, use cell phone, um, anytime product is moved, I'm just take a text, email. Um, I plan on setting up a similar email tree as we do for <coughs> notifications for people. Like, <coughs> so it's three growers and they are stewardships of the area. That's part of the rules and regulations that are in there. Um, I don't think they would be out there removing small oysters from the area. It's quite some time to grow anyway. Um, landings, the town does have the home run rule, the town to dictate where the oysters are landed. But we also have the division marine fisheries as well that also have the enforcement <coughs> as well as the town. Um, Shellfish could be landed in Citro Harbor very simply by both they can harvest and land within a reasonable amount of time. Even with in the 90, <coughs> 60 to 90 minutes of icing the catch during the summer months for, for the, the regrow viruses. Um, I plan to roll out a small, small deputy training program for folks that are interested in learning more about oyster aquaculture and things like that, probably 10 to 12 hours. Just have more eyes in the water. It's three growers, maybe 10 people out there in max at all times. But I think it, a lot of it comes down to the uh, communication and educating the folks of what's actually going on there. I think it's a good thing. You know, it was deemed as a pilot program. Um, we're we're lose, using less than 3% of the town's resource of the acres in that area. Um, we did scale back quite a bit, and like Susan said, um, it's all 
rates off the ground. So you're not really going to see these things except for maybe for a negative tide for maybe half hour. So it's most of it's your tidal from underground. We did move well away from Secret Beach and the, uh, the entrance to North Scituate. I think we raised those concerns. You know, the hard masters did look at this as well. We didn't have any concerns as far as navigation concerns. I don't either as well. So that's how we're going to roll out these four student training for any potential deputy constables, things like that. Maybe police officers could come be certified as well. Um, the police and hard master and fire, there's plenty of bullets to get out there as well. You can walk out there as well to other means. I'm not really too concerned about the enforcement of three growers. Duxbury handles some 25 rovers with no issues there. So very confident that this can be maintained. Thanks, Is that it? That's it. Back to you. Thank I you. promised we'd be like the yeah. same. Any questions from the board? Yeah. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, for the three acres that are identified for this purpose, how is what's the average depth or what's the what's the depth of the <laughs> The depth of the water from, from, oh. where, where well, from high tide to low tide? Yeah. Oh. Anywhere from, let's say, 7, 7 to 11, depending on the tide cycles. And is there anything in our regulations about the type of, of, of um, I can't remember, and I should have looked up before. Um, um, Do we specify the type of boat that can be used for um, harvesting or anything? Yeah. I, I just, yeah. Draw on you can use a kayak if you want. Okay. Um, Paddleboard. And the last question I had on this portion was um, this. So we have two five acre subsets. Nobody was interested in one. Yeah. Is the shellfish advisory indifferent to those two sites, or was there is there a reason that? Um, you know, we should why they one pick over one. There? We're only doing I three. think it's a little sand. I think the one has larger rods over on the other side, from what I remember from the survey that we did. So I suspect the one, the sites they picked for the better locations based on that, based on less, not as blood travel. And advised, the shellfish advisory is indifferent to any place within those 10 acres? Yeah, we would. Yeah. Thank you. Could you just tell me um, couldn't discern it from any of the maps. How far offshore that particular segment is? Those three acre plots. Like how far plots? offshore? Right. Uh, from um, Bassings Beach, it's over a thousand feet. Uh, I mean, over yeah, over a thousand. Okay. Um, probably more like fourteen hundred. And then from um, the little point, like the eight, the side area, um, it's over. It was like six seven hundred feet. Yeah, we, we did all the um, mapping on that. And then um, Glades, getting rid of that one up top, uh, Glades is probably, um, I don't know, probably similar to Bassings to reach 1400 or something. Okay. Okay. Um, we've been working on this for a while. I'm curious approximately how many other towns you see actually do agriculture? How unusual do you have? Is it Talk dozens. There's 30. So there's in 30 in Massachusetts, there's, there's 30, 30 municipalities. So even when we were doing the regulations, I think, um, yeah, we were in the 20s. Yeah, it's. Oh yeah, it's. Uh, it's a big industry for the state. I mean, it's number. It's like number three overall as oysters. Um, and then it would be number two if you talked about just Massachusetts waters. Scallops are. Harvested a little further out, but like scallops, lobsters, oysters, is is the ranking? Last I checked, maybe I don't know. Dave, keep me honest. Yes. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. All right. Thank you. Great. Great. So at this point, I don't have any questions. I I do just want to thank you, Mike, and the rest of the board for all the work you've done done on this. It's been five years. You've done a very professional job. You've used all the resources you can, and you've given us all the detailed information that we need, as well as the rest of the board and um, all the other town people that are involved in it. So thank you all for, your, for the energy you put into this. Um, what I'm going to do right now, before we get to the applicants, is I'm going to have a brief time period where we can talk about oyster farming in general. 
So if anybody has a question or a comment on that, we'll take some brief comments there before we actually get into the main part of the meeting, which is uh, to talk to the applicants. So I know there's uh, Zoom people as well. So we'll, what we're going to do, uh, Susan's managing that, we'll go back and forth between the two. So if you're on Zoom call and you have a, um, a question or a comment, and we're going to um, try not to be repetitive, um, just raise, raise your hand and we'll attend to you as well. Uh, sure, we'll start with you. Thank Just you. name and address to start. Uh, yes. Sean Sweeney, 9 Kona Hasselberg, Terrence Central. Um, my question is, in the last six months, we've had notification that the North River, due to sewage leaks, has been closed to shell fishing. And two summers ago, the area uh, that, that you're talking about for placing these farms, um, because of the amount of rain we had, was the water was brown for the entire summer. And there was the yellow flag flying in Coasa Harbor, indicating that it wasn't safe to swim in the inner harbor of Coasa Harbor. So my question is, why are we considering putting uh, anything in these waters that could, you know, there there is Coasa has a sewer system upriver from these farms, um, as well as uh, the, the pollution that comes with heavy rain coming out of the Gulf River. So why is this a good idea, and and who in their right mind? going to buy these oysters. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Mike, can you touch that? Yeah, so the areas are tested by the marine, Division of Marine Fisheries, sometimes weekly, sometimes monthly. In the event of a big rain event, everything would be closed for up to 40 hours, 24 hours, even on the tidal flush. And um, as far as recreational stuff, like the general mentioned for the North Ridge, South Rivers, and Rockland had the issue back in uh, late January, February. It was closed for some 21 days, and it's now closed right now because of uh, another issue due to rain. Um, I don't think the 21 days will stick in this instance. We're looking at how Rockland affects 13 miles away when all of our recreational stuff is in two big tidal surges on the North and South River, so that remains to be seen. But anytime there's a rain, rain event, no matter what town it is, Range fisheries will rule on it to close it down or keep it open and retest. That, that's how it goes in any community. So. Yeah, yeah, we're not different from other places right. that closed too. And that, and that area is conditionally approved, not truly approved, which truly approved is for year round. That is conditionally approved. It can be closed at any time um, based on sewer plant operations from Fort Hassett or algae bloom, things like that. So it's, it, you know, it's a risk, but there's no public health risk. So no different than any other community. And would you say it's open and clean and fishable? Way all more than all those not? results are online. Yes. And if it wasn't good, it would be closed. Any uh, comments for work there? Yeah, so what effect would it have if the shelf, if the beds were closed? They wouldn't harvest? They would simply let the oysters be? Yeah, they would just And then them. when the water is clean again, which the oysters actually help to clean water, um, then you would reopen and for whatever activity that the fisher person, fisherman, I mean, what are you supposed to say? Farmers. The farmers. Yes. The, thank you. Uh, what, whatever activities the farmers would normally be doing at that particular time, they would be able to go and do them. Yeah. And they're not always harvesting. No. So in that instance, what would happen is the British fishery would probably mandate that the meats are tested before it goes to harvest or sale. Anyone on the Zoom with a question? I don't see that. Anyone else in here? I'm going to go to the man in the blue for you. Yeah. yeah. Just name and address. Yeah, I'm Frank Moraki, and I live at 67 Fields Drive. And I'm here to speak on behalf of an organization in the Fisherman and Fisherman of Form called Friends of Socialist Eastern Development. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. And its primary purpose is to maintain the viability of fishing in general. It doesn't speak to shell fishing or aquaculture or ocean fishing, just fishing in situ. And uh, I personally think this is a very good idea, and I recommend that you approve it. But uh, my arguments are the following. Uh, number one, that fishing, again, the generic fishing, including this, uh, both projects, of the projects, uh, <coughs> is part of situ culture. 
Uh, you know, I fished out of Central for 55 years. I grew up on the dock. I worked my whole life on the dock, and I'm retired. I sold out of the dock almost every day. It's really colorful. Front Street is basically a true working waterfront, and I see nothing that stops this activity, even though it's in North Central, not at the harbor, becoming part of that culture. Number two is economics. Most fishing right now brings in the order of $4 million a year in ex vessel value to the town of Situate. That's ex vessel, that's right off the boat. And we're working on trying to get some uh, value added through selling the local fish products and I hope local oysters uh, through retailers and restaurants in town, adding more to the value of that catch and just the ex vessel value. And then the final piece of this is food security. You know, everybody kind of blows it off food security. But someday maybe we're going to be very happy that we have uh, an ocean full of fish and an aquaculture operation going. The supply chain is disrupted and things go wrong, as we've seen them going wrong in the last few years. We'll be able to rely on this. This is just one more little linchpin. It's only two, three small aquaculture leases, but it's not insignificant. I think it's important. So I hope you consider these facts when you're deciding the uh, final choice and approving or disapproving these uh, proposals. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I want to hand it to you. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, Jeff McClellan, 166 Bond Street, Cobasset. Um, I was reading the uh, shellfish agricultural regulations and in section 4.5 it states that no license shall permit a licensee to material obstruct navigational water. I don't understand how approving at this point three acres, maybe later on even more acres, but three acres at this point of submerged oyster trays, whatever you're calling them, uh, that will be hidden from view and from, uh, uh, from folks uh, uh, boating, sailing, whatever out there. Uh, how that can be uh, a navigational hazard and how it is not going to obstruct navigation. I, I mean, all of them will be marked, right? At every corner of every yes. um, acre, there'll be flags or buoys. Um, and then you throw a white corner mark that's not what they provide. So alerting people to that area. So and those, and those those buoys will also be registered with the Coast Guard under Aton, which is a private easy navigation. Yep. And if I heard you correctly a while ago, you said that you've met with the harbor master yes. and you've tried to find areas that are not highly rec recreational areas and um, out of the main flow of water. It's not there a federal channel, which class does have three federal channels. Into it. It's not, this, this is an area of the harbor that is heavily used by uh, water skiers and tubers. And, uh, you know, people do what they do. And even if it's marked, they're going to go through it. Someone's going to get hung up. It's, a, it's an accident waiting to happen. Okay. Last comment, uh, Bill? Yeah. Um, tonight's presentation, you have three plots. The original proposal was for 32 um, on total, total uh, project. I'm going to stop you there because that's been a huge misnomer from the beginning, and some people have been posting things about that. What the committee came back to us and says there are 32 potential places that meet the requirements where oyster farming could be done. As Susan mentioned in the beginning of her proposal, initially the maximum that we were talking is a pilot of eight. And it very quickly that shrunk to seven to five, and now it's shrunk to three. So 32 or 33 was, although it's been said, has never ever been in, in the thought of the committee or the, the project. I have a map at home that shows the original proposal. It's it's not, well, you're misreading it because what it showed is there's 32 potential acres for doing it. So my but the project never went above eight and it shrunk in every time since. My question tonight would be. How many do you propose in the future? At this point, we're dealing with three. I mean, what we want to do as a board is pilot this and see how it goes, if it's successful, <coughs> are there any problems that we haven't already thought about that have come about, and then future boards will decide whether it continues or it grows.
there anyone on Zoom? Anyone else? I, again, I know there's about 15 or 20 people on Zoom. We're going to shut down the conversation for oyster farming and get into the applicants after this last comment. Yep. Yes, sir. You go. Thank you. My name is Dale Levitt. I'm uh, with the Falmouth, Massachusetts. I'm an emeritus professor at Dr. Jerry University. I've worked for 16 years at the Solution Institute. Can you just speak up just a little bit? Because I know that this might have um, so I, I have been working in the aquaculture industry, uh, doing research and technology transfer for about the last 40 years. Uh, I currently retired now from academia, and I own two oyster farms in Washington. And so I'm, I don't have a dog in this way. Um, I'm here not to tell you whether you should or should not allow it, but I am here to keep the science honest. So if you have any questions, concerning any comments or statements that are made relative to the scientific aspects of our question we have to answer. Thank you very much. All right, so at this point, we're going to, and unless the board has anything to add, so we're going to end the, the general conversation about agriculture, and we're going to get into it and talk to each of the three applicants individually, and um, and then if any questions pop up about them, then we can go to that. Um, so, excuse me. Yeah. So, may I ask so one question? I apologize. Um, in viewing the applicants, there are two different types of um, pages. You know, one applicant is doing off bottom, and two are on bottom, according to what they checked off. Okay. How does that impact that sharing of that area? At all, like does it at all? Like, I don't understand, and that's what I'm just trying to understand as far as would one situation be more prevalent than another, or is it the equal? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So, so that's this technique with fishing, like seeing where like the cops are fishing, some guys fish three foot traps, some guys fish four foot traps. I'm just gonna dive probably talk better to that, but uh, it's still it's all technique, it's water flow. Um, they're going to explore if it works better on the bottom anchor or floating. Um, I think floating would give more water flow through the oyster if they breathe more and filter more, but that's just me. But it's their technique, it's their, their acreage to work on to get their best product to grow as fast as they can to sell. So there's some different techniques to any kind of fishing. And, are, and, and will they be flexible to adjust, you know, post, uh, you know, you know keep post award of a license from DNF, or do they have to maintain that type of um, setup going forward? So say an off-bottom line to become an on-bottom. Yeah. So, I mean, they have to, our regs say they have to stay within the 18 inches, but I don't know if DNF makes that. That's a great question. I don't think it would change too much, but it would be definitely good to know yeah. how they're actually doing it. But just to, you said floating, but when you say floating, yeah, it's, it's, it's 16 inches. Right. Right. So it's only, nothing's going to get to the top unless the tide comes down. It's 18 inches or lower from the bottom. Correct. It's just to get a little bit of flow under it. To, to, for, for the, um, and we do have a um, hand raised on them too. So oh, yeah. I can recognize if you're ready. Yeah, although that was the last. Okay. <laughs> All right, Mary, you are the last. Any Mary, words? you should be able to um, speak now. She's not mute. Uh, she needs. There are some chairs up front if you guys. You can just take use. Do you need some help, Mary? Do you need, Mary, go ahead. Uh, your name. She's unmuted. She and, should uh, be able to just speak. Just go ahead and speak. Mary, Mary, are you there? You should be able to speak. Okay, I'm going to guess that she did it by accident. Okay. If you, again, just push the raise hand button if you want to speak. Um, all right, the first applicants that we're going to see a presentation from are uh, Jamie Davenport and Greg Wallingford. Yes, come up. All right. 
Let us just get your applications up. Sure. Well, good. Yeah. All right, so Jamie and, and, and Greg, give us a little overview of your, your history, your background, and what you're going to do. Um, and uh, and then we'll just kind of open it up for questions. We have your application, we've looked at it, and um, we'll kind of go from there. And could I just read, could I read a page that I've prepared? <laughs> Quickly. It's respectful. Yeah. Okay. Just, before you start doing sure. this, anybody who wants to see the full application, they're available on the uh, Fish Health Fish Advisory page. <clears throat> thank you, members of the Select Board, for this opportunity. And a sincere thank you to everyone over the last five years who helped craft this and carefully considered aquaculture pilot program before you today, including former Select Board members John Danny and Sean Harris, Brad McMillan and the Waterways Committee, Sue DePisa and the EDC, Constable Mike DeMeo. Susan Harrison and the Shellfish Advisory Committee, Jack Buckley and Susan Bryan of CCSCR, Vision Marine Fisheries, and all the recreational stakeholders who provided input and collaborated on this project. These folks recognize the benefits of the Shellfish Aquaculture Program, and for that I'm grateful. Over the last five years, the voices of, the voices of those most critical of this project have been the loudest. Terms like industrial oyster farm, for the profit of a few, destruction of Cohasset Harbor, have been published in online forums and in print. Oyster farming has even been compared to deforestation of redwoods in California and oil drilling in Alaska. The picture being painted is a familiar one, that of carpetbaggers descending upon an unsuspecting town bent on profiting off of their resources, relying on their ignorance and goodwill, leaving a wake of destruction behind. I understand that the opposition is driven by fear, but their fear has been stoked by intentional misinformation. Make no mistake, a small number of people are responsible for this clever fear monger. Shellfish aquaculture is not destructive. On the contrary, if done sustainably, shellfish aquaculture can be restorative. The structures that oysters are grown on and in provide an attractive home for aquatic life and add to the biodiversity of the waters in which they are grown. <clears throat> Please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Jamie Davenport. I've been married to the love of my life for 20 years. We've been raising our three boys, ages 10, 12, and 16, in Situate for the last 14. We moved to Situate in 2009 to lessen the commute to my oyster farm on the Cape while still allowing her to commute to Boston on the train. When I'm not working on my farm, I'm spending all of my time with my boys. Over the last 11 years, I've coached each one of them in multiple sports and served as their den leader in our local Cub Scout pack. I'm an active member of this community. I voted in every town election and attend every town meeting. My family has grown to love this town. And for our two youngest boys, it is all they have ever known. It is our home. My partner, Greg Wallingford, was born and raised in Cohasset. He is also married, has two children, and owns his own small business. He is a board member of the Cohasset Conservation Trust, which owns and maintains the western portion of Basin Beach. He is also very active in his community and is involved in several charitable foundations. I want to be clear that we care about these towns, and we would never knowingly do anything to harm them. We truly believe this aquaculture program is a solid way for situates to complement our local seafood industry and vibrant restaurant scene. Irish moss was once harvested from our shores, both in Situate and Cohasset. Shellfish aquaculture offers us a way to utilize our marine resources in much the same way. We should be actively pursuing new ways to make a living from the sea. It's all around us. Commercial activity in the harbor can coexist with recreation. This is not a new concept. 30 other towns in the Commonwealth have found a way. Thank you. Sorry if that was too long. <laughs> so let, let's uh, tell us a little bit about what what your experience is, what you want to do, and why you want to do it here, and just a quick overview of why we should give you this license. So um, I've uh, been running an oyster farm on the Cape and Dennis for the last 15 years, this is my 15th season. Um, it's been profitable since year three, uh, except for the, the, the year of the pandemic in which I mean, most oyster farms were, were negative. Um, uh, several years in, probably in about 2013 or 2014, um, I, I, I felt seeing the, the fishing industry and the lobstering industry struggling uh, with lowering quotas, I thought that it might be an interesting thing to pursue aquaculture in situate. So I met with uh, the harbor master at the time, Patterson, and um, we, we discussed the possibility of bringing aquaculture in situate. We couldn't find any place that was viable to do it. I remember going out with Joe Strazdez, who was the constable, the shellfish constable at the time. Um, he took me up and down the north and south rivers and we looked around and we couldn't really find any place that was, that, that was viable. Fast forward to, I think it was 2016 or 2017, 
And uh, Greg and I met each other at a uh, soccer tournament at Gillette Stadium. And I mentioned that I was an oyster farmer. And he mentioned that he was from Cohasset and it was a dream of his and a friend of his to do to get into something like this. And he clued me into the idea, into the notion that I hadn't yet thought of. And that is that outer Cohasset Harbor is actually situated waters. Once he you know, mentioned that the light bulb went off and we did some more investigating and uh, came and to the conclusion. Proof by the EMF for these things. It was open for shellfish harvesting, yeah. Jamie, I'm going to cut you off here just for okay. a minute. I don't need this, but we, we too much history. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I, 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 I think that there's a, a, a um, you know, the, 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 sea, the shellfish industry, oysters in particular, uh, any seafood dealer would tell you that, that there's an insatiable appetite for oysters out there. Um, growers can't meet that demand. Um, there, there's a market for it here. Um, we, we've got a, a very vibrant local community of restaurants and, you know, Untold Brewery was opened up recently. Um, I think that, um, that a local homegrown, homegrown situate branded oyster would be great for the community. Um, both of our, yeah, both of our communities, both situate and classic. I, I know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a little bit more direct. Okay. So you don't need to pitch it to us, right? It's, it's been voted. So I wanna know why you, you, are, why we should give it to you. So you started out 15 years in the business. Yeah. How, how big you farm down in, in the game? We have two acres and two we two grow acres. roughly 2 million oyster seed per year. Um, our operation will be on a smaller scale in situ, at, at least in, in, in the beginning. But um, the amount that we that you can grow a farm is based on how much acres you have. And so if we only have one acre, I can't imagine ever growing more than like a million oysters on that farm. Um, so I'm confident that I can help lead this, you know, ragtag crew of three oyster farmers um, to a successful pilot program, um, and that you know we'll. Uh, Help each other along the way, and I have the, the skills and the, the know it all good. What are you going to do? Well, I was a financial advisor for 25 yeah. years, and I was just looking for a change of scenery, basically. And I met Jamie seven years ago. Um, I had spoken to another friend of mine from Cohasset about the possibility of doing this in, in Cohasset. Obviously, it's situate waters. It was approved by the DMF in situate, so it was something that we put on the back burner until I met Jamie. Um, I'm hoping that we can not only have a, uh, a successful business, but collaborate with local businesses, collaborate with uh, the CSCR and the town and our, and our schools to help uh, bring aquaculture to, to you know, students. Uh, do you have any experience? I, have, I do not. But, but I, do not. I mean, I, I, I grew up in around the harbor, as I said, I, I've been a member of the Alaska uh, Center for the last. 11 years, uh, kids sit down there. Um, I'm a, a board member of the Professor Conservation Trust and, and, and a steward of the properties, cottages out on Baskin's Beach. Um, and I spend a lot of time there. And I, I, I love the area. And it's something that, that I just want to do. I've wanted to do for the last uh, 10 years, really, where we met Jamie. It was, it was something that I thought could really help. So I'm going to open up to you guys in one second. But one thing I'd like to so you've heard. So this is a controversial issue, right? You've got the butters there, yep. the Cohasset people that mm -hmm. use that area that don't want to do this project, right? So how how do you guys see their concerns of being mitigated by you? You know, how, how are their how what could you say to them that would make them feel that this isn't going to be? And you started on that path a second ago, mm -hmm. as bad as they may envision it because they haven't seen it. Right. It's I, I believe it's our job to prove to them that what what we say, what we're saying is true. That you know we'll be respectful, um, cognizant of everyone's opinions and concerns, and and show not through words but through action that that we can live together. You know, and that in, in, in the end, I think that this will actually enhance recreation. And we want to give a good point of interest to, to, the, to the area. I mean, we want we just I, again. I'm an environmentalist. I'm on the board of our, our land trust. Uh, fishermen are good stewards of the ocean, and and we will continue that. So you rec you recreated in that area. You know that area very well. Very well. Yeah. So I mean, I've, I was born and raised in the last time. Do you see the area of these farms being an issue with recreation in the area? No, because uh, you know a, a good part of the day every day. It's inaccessible by the tides. Uh, the uh, 
the, role, the, the CMI, the cross growers, don't go anywhere near where those farms are going, the proposed farms are going. Um, I know that uh, the, the yacht club's options generally go out through the channel and, and out in the, in the water. Uh, across the Santa Club, uh, you know, as I said, my, my kids spent seven years down there, and, and neither one of them said they ever sailed in that area, ever. So I, I don't see it being a hindrance to recreational activities. I use the area. You know, I, I have a boat in, in the harbor, and I, I don't see how it's going to, it'll have minimal impact on the I've talked to much all of them, too, but do you have uh, specific? Yeah. Um, first of all, Greg, thank you for saying that. Is that, those, that was exactly the line I was going to go down, was to really have some good testimony from the experience of what has the person on the water. But Jamie, um, as a current oyster farmer, um, you're in Dennis, correct? Mm -hmm. Are you in Duxbury as well? Or just no, Dennis? just Dennis. Yeah. Can you share with us any type of Conflict that you came up against with the recreational aspect. Do you share space in Dennis as well with recreational? Um, they're not. We don't usually see them because we're kind of an opposite, you know, okay. one opposite schedule. So um, when I'm out on out and out in uh, on the farm, it's low tide, so there's no there are no boaters. At high tide, people do go over our. I guess my experience is just having seen the aftermath. You know, like once in a while, I'll find. Um, a bag ripped open, you know, like a, um, a fishing line hooked on into or some person like that. Um, so people do can and, and do continue to, to travel over the farms at high tide. I think in much the same way that they're going to be able to here. And I fully recognize that, you know, stuff happens. You know what I mean? You grumble about a piece of your, your gear being injured, but then again, we're sharing. I mean, this is this public trust lands. I mean, that's what that every fish takes with any net or any trap yeah. there. Yeah, okay. um, but the, far, the, the, the farms there in Dennis have been there since the 90s. And then the second wave that my father got in on and I in turn got in, you know, got in on it uh, was back in 2003 and 2004. And in the past 17 years, we really haven't had very many, very many issues with any other competing interests. Um, you know, where, where we are is a very, uh, on land, the access to, that, to the farm. Um, is a is like a, a world class birding area, so you do see a lot of people out birding and, and you know uh, walking with their dogs. Lots of you know lots of uh, dog walkers. So you have to travel slowly and be respectful, and, you know, and, and just just be you know open and kind and not be tearing through the the woods, you know, like a bat out of hell and running people down. You know what I mean? Like where where I have I have decent experience with uh, with uh, you know living side by side with other. Yeah. yeah, how much money and equipment do you estimate you're going to be investing in this? Because I think there's been some um, talk that this is free to you mm -hmm. and that, you know, what's in it for the town. But I'm more interested in knowing specifically how much money, how much equipment, and how much time you're going to mm -hmm. be investing in this venture. I think in order to do that, we'd have to, like, pick a number, like pick a specific number and say, hypothetically speaking, if we were to grow, say, a half a million oyster seed on the farm, um, then there's the cost of that actual oyster seed. So that would be roughly $3,000 per 100,000. So right there, there's an investment of $15,000. Um, you have to, to think of those oysters in terms of being all housed in some kind of an apparatus, whether it be a cage or a bag. Um, I would have to, so, Say that 500,000 oysters would probably take roughly 500 cages, you know, um, and each one of those cages is probably about $150. There's another, you know, $7,000 or whatnot. Um, there's uh, the, the need for a boat, the need for a vehicle, the need for consumables like the sail backs that one uses, the harvest tracking tax that one uses. The fuel there was there is a, this is not a get rich you know quick scheme i've been doing this for 15 years and i'm successful but i'm no means rich my family is two two you know income family and yet we still somehow end up living paycheck to paycheck um this is not winning the lottery this is it's it's hard work um but it's something that will be that we're we're up you know up for the challenge and and 
I'm looking forward to, I, I did see a comment, something about, you know, each farmer um, has, has made, has made it known that they're, they're going to work the farm themselves and it's not going to, you know, um, require any jobs. I would have to envision that each farm would probably need around three people working their farm. So we're probably talking about in the neighborhood of anywhere between eight to 12, eight to 12 people that, that can include the owners, but, you know, on top of, of the three or four owners, uh, we will need help, you know, and while I'll probably most likely, I, I want to include my, my children, my boys and teach them about hard work include them, but we will have paying, you know, paid positions as well. Well, thank you for your perseverance. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. How, um, for you being involved, how important to kind of be good stewards to the area is water quality to you? If you are seeing someone now that has sort of places, some other boat are polluting or doing something, how, how much this is your livelihood? Does that bother you to see? I'm assuming that you need to maintain and make sure that the area, that you're, you're the eyes and ears yeah. for a lot of folks. So I don't know if you can take it through, if you've seen anything, but man, I really need to make sure that this is a, a clean and safe environmentally protected area. Um, correct. Well, I mean, obviously, you know, there's things that are beyond our control if someone wants to do something nefarious. I don't know if anything about that, but. The, the, the benefit of, of the area is that, you know, water's coming in and out. It's almost directly uh, you know, accessible, directly, it is directly accessible to the outer ocean. So, you know, when it's, when it's flush out, you know, it, the water's tested uh, pretty regularly. It has to be. Um, you know, if, it, if it fails um, certain criteria, then we have to shut down. And, you know, we're prepared for that after I think what Andrew was trying to get at though might have been um, like how prepared are we to be stewards of the environment and if we did see something like see something say something you know what I mean um, I, I haven't had too many um, experiences with that in Dennis along the way it's more it's more about um, finding finding injured wildlife you know like I've, I've come across like a porpoise that was stranded I mean you one needs to call um, you know call the uh, fishing game or whatnot um, but that can also directly translate to, to human, you know, issue, uh, to other issues that, you know, where humans aren't behaving appropriately. And yes, we are, like you said, you said it best, that we're, we're the eyes and ears of the area out there. I think more so than those that are out there for recreation, because you're either having fun, you're not really paying attention, but you're right, this is our livelihood, and this is, you know, it's important to us. We also so have our investors will have, um, Boston Police Department has a boat now that they routinely patrol, um, and, and Lori, our other master, has um, folks that work for her as well. So you know, there's, there's other people out there in all the situations. So, yeah. It was just my method that was on the ground. You want to make, maintain that area and you know, be concerned about it because that's yeah. your life. That's what they're concerned about. You don't want to see destruction impacts. Yeah. Yeah. Destruction. Yeah. We had a couple of te technical questions. So mm -hmm. thank you for the thorough application and thank you for the shellfish for going through it and, and, and coming through the plan to come. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of things that we hadn't talked about before in learning about this technology. A page, I think it's 23 of yours, there's cages for when, when, when the oysters get mature, they switch to a different kind of cage. From, yeah, typically from a sea bag to a cage. Okay, and so are those, will they, I assume they'll, they'll adhere to the regulations, but they look, are they laid vertically or horizontally? Because they look, in the, at least in the images provided, like tall things. There, um, most trap companies don't manufacture cages any higher than 18 inches, specifically because most municipalities <laughs> in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts have that 18 inch work. Well, they have to because it's a division of marine fishery. Um, regulation. So none of the cages that I believe we included in our, as an example, in our application, nor would the ones we, were, we, we would be using in, in real life, would be any higher than the Yeah, it's at 18 inches in it. So it sits yeah. on the ground? Or? Yes, they have like six inch tall, um, four to six inch tall um, bent wire feet that prevent them from being sanded in so that the oysters don't die. Yeah. Um, and so the water can flow underneath them. 
Okay, and then the other question was in your um, uh, projection, your six year projection of, mm -hmm. of you know, expenses and revenue. Um, it shows a steady growth in the amount of oysters that you because you'll phase them in. Yeah. And it, and it, it, I think it referenced 300 racks at one point would be like the build out. Does that, that would be to one acre? That it does, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like um, spatially, I couldn't figure out how that So was. the our original application, which we produced in 2020, um, was for the intertidal space. I don't envision being able to use anywhere near the amount of rack and bag on the farm as as we would have been able to in the intertidal space. Because I would imagine that maybe the first 50 feet, and this is all going to be trial and error, um, of the farm out to the sea, it would probably be accessible uh, enough that one could install racks and have bags on top. But the majority of the farm is going to have to be caged because a lot of the, it, it, there are good portions of the farm where it will probably never come out of the water. Um, so one would need to have a small boat kind of, you know, bobbing and bobbing next to you. Um, um, we're using a data to pull them up. Um, but uh, yeah, it does I mean 300 racks. So the, the rack the rack system that I use um, is 20 feet long and it pulls 12 bags on the top. So if you had 300 racks, that would be um, 3,600 bags basically. Um, I do have that many on my farm, but that's across two acres and that's using primarily a rack and bag system. So how many would you put out the first year? Um, not many, so that's the thing is that the first couple of years, the oysters are seed, or you know, are just little baby seed, and then they grow like popcorn volume wise over the ensuing two years. Um, so, in the first uh season, say if we were to deploy say 300,000 oyster seed, each bag would have roughly 2,000 oysters in, in each bag. Um, so we would have roughly 150 bags of oysters. Um, and then at, towards the end of that season in the fall, that would multiply to 300. So there would really only be um, 300 divided by 12 racks out there. And the last, last question I have for you guys is I think it was in your application that you referenced in nursery in the harbor. Is that your application? That, that, that's a, um, an idea for the future if the pilot program is to work. There are provisions in the Division of Marine Fisheries regulations where one can grow out, so we've talked about this before, one can grow seed up to a certain size and then transfer it to an area where it can be grown out for, for uh, harvest and then ultimately consumption. And I thought we thought it would be a great idea to have a more visible part of the operation um, of, the, of the aquaculture program where uh, people down the town of would actually see it, you know? So it's an idea right now. It's, it's an idea, yes. Okay. Yeah, it was like, did I miss that? No, yeah. So the, our, the oyster seed for now is obviously is just field plant. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Um, a couple of quick things. You just mentioned pilot period. Mm -hmm. What do you think the reasonable time period for a period would be to, to understand whether you're successful and whether the program is successful mm -hmm. is it a three year window or I, th I would think you would need to have at least four or five years personally. Um, there may be a small number of oysters to harvest in at the end of year two and into year three, but it's really a cumulative effect and, and you really have to kind of get into year four and five to start to see a profit um, and to, to really see that everything is working. Is that what we thought in terms of a window of reevaluating or looking yeah, at three years? Oh. Yeah. Okay. Um, I may I, I think what we also said was is as we go along, if there are changes or issues that come up, that's the whole point of having a pilot yeah. so that you can, you know, make adjustments, but uh, you yeah, know you obviously have to give you enough time to see if this is a viable good business mm -hmm. for everyone. But I would imagine if, you know, in the first couple of years, if there was some glaring issue where it, it proved that we couldn't, we can't coexist with the existing interests out there, then, you know, the business would have to be shuttered earlier than that. And we're, we're well aware of that from a, a business standpoint um, and, and seeing if it's viable and profitable from that viewpoint, I think we need more advice. I think that was more of my point that you, you know, if after three years, 
you know, the, there's some risk on your side too when you're going down yes. the center because, it, you know, I think I think the board is going to get a reasonable amount of time to to stick or not stick, but at some point in time, the stick the stick can be pulled up and we say this is yeah. going to happen, and that's a risk that you guys are. Willing and to luckily, take. I have a lot less risk than some others because I can simply have my existing form absorb whatever loss time. Mean test all the oysters from situate for disease and then have them transplanted back down to my farm in Cape. And I could absorb all the gear that we've used and just not buy gear for the next 20 years. Um, and I could probably help, you know, offload, the, you know, those of the, the other applicants. No, I, my point is there's some risk involved on your, your side. There is. Correct. Um, Correct. One other risk I just want to bring up is, and as you've dealt with already, the first time we did this, you got sued. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I were to bet, you're going to get sued again, I would imagine, probably before the end of the week. Um, so um, so I just want to make you to be aware of the fact that that's another risk that you're taking mm -hmm. as you get into this venture until we get a, a hearing from the Attorney General and until we get, um, you know, get everything in order, mm -hmm. um, there is that risk involved. Yeah, well, it was, my, it was our feeling that um, that this process can run concurrently with the process of the Attorney General's yeah. office. Well, we expect to hear from them within, I would say, by the end of next month. But again, this is more just informational. I don't want you to come back later and say, oh, I didn't know. I was no, yes, we're, we're fully aware of that. Great. And, no. and my last question is uh, transportation. Mm -hmm. How are you going to get out to the site? The vehicles. What kind of boat are you using? Um, I, I currently own a 17 foot Carolina uh, skiff. Um, uh, the intention is if, if this works um, and it's viable, to probably graduate to maybe like a 24 foot uh, Caroline skiff. How are you going to get there? Um, either uh, trailer and come around from Situate Harbor or leave via um, Park Rattle. What was the second one? Park Rattle and Comasso. And I have a boat. I have two boats actually. So there's been some, some scuttlebutt that Comasso may not be really inviting of people that launch from their harbor. Right, they don't allow us to, to land. Yeah. Um, and to but you could drop and then yeah. go back and there. And yeah. Again, just things you want to make sure everyone's on the same page and they're important. What we've heard. Uh, yes. Understood. Awesome. Well, Jamie, you've, you've been a, kind of a spearhead on this. You've got the most experience. You know, I think that's part of why I and probably the rest of the board feel comfortable with this. If, if you can't make it, then as an experienced person, then it's probably not a, a doable mm -hmm. venture. So, um, so I think you're going to kind of be the, you know, the kind of company to follow through the process. I'm ready. Any other questions for Jamie? Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't want to move on, but I just want to ask one question. I want the other applicants also to think about this. Um, just in everything that I watched and read, you know, advice to new farmers was to consider how are you going to, going to secure your sites. Um, I think it's important. It's a lot of folks who are happy that you would be there. So can you share that really briefly, like what you would do to monitor your sites to make sure that they do maintain safe and intact? Mm -hmm. and I guess just making sure that we visit as much as we can. Um, is that usually daily? In the first year, not daily, because unless you want to go out and watch water, like it's like watching water, <coughs> watching the seeds grow, it, it, it won't, you know, it won't be very intensive in the first uh, 12 months. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that there will be some way where we can somehow, you know, get some cameras that point out in that direction so we can see if, if there's, I mean, for, if there are issues, yeah. Um, there's drones um, as well. Drones, drones yeah. yeah. Uh, word of mouth, you know, I mean, he's, he's lives in situation and has a lot of friends that will. Like That's great. I just, you know, it was brought yeah, to my And opinion. again, you know, I'm a recreational voter. I spent a lot of time on weekends there. You know, so uh, yeah, we want to be out there. Maybe not necessarily just monitoring the farms, but just be out there. You know, well, we have your investment. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna set a tent up in the my parking lot. I don't think that's. I, I think our neighbors are, are our neighbors. And there's not going to be any sort of criminal activity or that. I So yes, you know, the people that are against it are passionate for their reasons and. But I, I don't think there's any. And it's our job to prove to them that. No, that wasn't that what I was saying. We are. It, it, it's no, no, just I, a normal I, course of action of starting a business that you have security against. Yeah. yeah. And I was not phone that. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank um, you. Thank in. you. And we'll discuss how we vote in a bit.
Um, Mike, I think you're next. So the good thing is we're going to ask you all the same question. <laughs> <laughs> we won't be able to do it in depth. No, no. Again. You don't have to do the sales pitch. Okay. Just we, we really just want to know, uh, you know, you were Jamie came in as a as a seasoned farmer. Right. You know, what's your experience in this? And how, why are you doing this? And, and how are we gonna make sure that you're gonna be successful doing this as well? Yeah, um, well, I've, worked, I've actually worked on Jamie's farm a little bit in the past, um, just, to get a, just to get a rough idea of like, you know, to, originally when I first found out about this stuff was actually through a, a segment on 60 Minutes. I saw a guy in Connecticut who was doing something similar and wasn't that long, wasn't too long thereafter that that I met Jamie and found out what he was doing. So I told him I, you know, I had already heard a little bit about it and I was interested in his stuff. And, and this was kind of coming together at that point. Was, I met Jamie basically right when the shellfish committee had formulated it was just barely getting rolling. So um, so the timing was good for me that way, motivational as it's so let me ask, this may give the board a little bit of sense. Are you, do you consider yourself more of a commercial? Like Jamie's doing this to make a living. Right. Are you more of a recreational person or are you more of a commercial person? Are you I would say, yeah, I would say it's more commercial than recreational. Um, you need to make a living, I don't really. Yeah. Yeah. So you're gonna maximize the space and you're gonna- Yeah, you're gonna do, okay. um, I, initially I think I'll have to kind of hedge my bet a little bit and basically scale it up over time. I don't, I'm not gonna buy the maximum amount of seed or the maximum amount of cages and everything and completely cover, you know, maximize the space that I have available without knowing kind of where that's gonna lead, you know? So um, like I can afford to, to gamble on this and take a shot at it and I feel good about that, but I don't wanna put all my eggs in one basket. Do you have any idea in terms of percentage wise what your thought process is in terms of um, are you going to go with like trying 50% of the site to start or? Yeah, well, I think um, kind of as Jamie alluded to as well, when you buy the seed and it's really small, it doesn't take up as much space as more mature oysters would. So, you know, I'd like to start with maybe a couple hundred thousand seed and um, and see if that, see how much space that takes and how much that, you know, how soon, what, how much, what percentage of that I lose and how fast they're growing and everything. And kind of build that into my budget. Um, so experience wise, you've worked part time with a few, with Jamie's thing to get a sense of what you're doing. Right. And um, I also I used to go what they call trip fishing, commercial fishing. So I have experience with that. Um, taking three college level classes. One at um, Professor Levitt's class at Roger Williams. I'm also taking business of aquaculture class. I took through UMass and I took a science of aquaculture from UMass as well to try to prepare myself to have a better understanding of how it's typically goes in 10 mil. Great. Um, I also have a, I have a landscaping company here in town and I have a dumpster business here in town and those are hands-on, you know, out in the sun every day. That's out in the wet or sun or wind or rain, cold, snow, whatever, the weather. And um, so I am familiar with and capable of, you know, fighting through that kind of stuff too. Do you feel you have enough time? I do. To dedicate to this? I do. Yeah. yeah. I think it's really important to us that whoever does this doesn't do it haphazardly so that it's a mess or that it, right. you know, stuff's blown on around and, you know, it isn't doing it properly because they don't have the energy or the time to put it through. Yeah, right. Um, well, on those lines, I, I couldn't afford to, to try to do this if I wasn't going to put a good effort. I can't just 
spend a bunch of money and just cross my finger, right? And I have, you know, just my own personality, I'll be out there checking on it. So I'll be, for one, I'll be curious as much as anything, just to see how it's progressing. And I'd be worried if I didn't go check on it, so I'll be going out there for that reason too. And I would imagine that the three of you will have some sort of collaboration between you where you're yeah. looking at each other's, you know, working together as opposed to competing. Absolutely. I, certainly, that's the way I hope it works, and that's the way I want it to work. Um, I've spoken, frankly, with both of them before that, you know, particularly with Jamie, where he does have all that experience, like, certainly in the early stages, like, I'm going to look to him for advice on a lot of things and, you know, kind of copycat, I think, a certain amount of things that he's trying. Um, I also think I might try some things he doesn't do, just in terms of maybe gear a little bit. Just, you know, he's got his way of doing it, and I, from what I understand, is one of the more successful ways. But at the same time, my curiosity is, I think I'll want to try maybe a little bit of different gear and see if we get better results out of that. And, you know, kind of experiment with it a little bit. That's going to be part of the fun of it, I think. Who would like to have more stuff? Just two quick questions. Um, yeah, um, first question is the, uh, obviously Jamie and tomorrow who are you going to be working with to, to farm? Um, so I don't have any partners, so the employees and stuff. Um, <coughs> I took the classes through UMass, the professor there, they had a lot of students, but I was the only one that was headed towards potentially having a farm and stuff. So. I got talking with her, and we talked about maybe trying to set up some type of internship program. But those classes are through the UMass Boston campus, so they're not that far away. So I thought it was maybe we could bring kids like that along and see if they could help out a little bit. And I'm not kidding, but students, you know, and um, try to do maybe some type of internship program with them. And they were, she was very receptive, receptive to that. She said she'd have to talk it over with their talk department chair and stuff like that, but as long she basically said, as long as you're not looking for funds from us, we could probably make something work. And yeah, it hadn't even crossed my mind to ask them for money. So these are students in agriculture. Yes. Yeah. You know, I figured they'd probably be energetic and interested in what we're doing. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you mentioned that you have a lot of students. Um, what kind of what kind of things do you look for in the in the students that you're looking for? Like what kind of what kind of things are you looking for? Um, ideally I think that would be a good fit. And then um, have employees do the landscaping company and everything, but I needed a guy for a day or, you know, things got a little off track or something, I could probably bring more help out of there. I needed to, I don't really want to do it that way, but I forgot to have options. And your application said that you have a Carolina skip too, and you're going to be putting- I don't own a Carolina skip, I do intend to buy Okay, so that's part of your business plan is to get the- Right. You know how to vote? Yes. Okay. And you're gonna you you would presumably put in that partner as well. As, yeah, as long as that's gonna pan out and be you know, safe and everything or whatever, you know, as long as it's gonna be kosher, I guess this I'll do that. Here. If it's not that I'll probably the skips are flat bottom and if I have to go from citrus, I'd probably go something with a deeper hall so I can get through a little more water. I'll just ask, what made you stick with this for so long? Um, I don't know. It, it's a combination of things. One, the main one is I, I really want to do it. You know, it just seems like it's kind of in a lot of different ways. It's, uh, you know, it's, if it works out well, it's going to work out well for me. So that's financially, so I like that. Uh, I'm always, I'm outside all the time. I always have that. My kids are. And, I do care about the environment quite a bit. And, um, I love the idea of how, how the oysters, you know, they filter the water on a daily basis, and it's actually a good thing. Um, my wife and I, we both eat fairly healthy, and oysters are a very healthy food source, high in protein, and very, very lean and very healthy. So it's, in those ways, it's good. Um, honestly, part of it, why, why I've stuck with it is um, along with those reasons, it, it also hasn't been that hard for me to want to stick with. You know, it's, it's something I want to do, and then 
you know, people push against you, against something you believe in, you, my reaction is kind of like stick to my guns a little bit and want to keep going. You know, if I, if I heard someone come up with better example, better reasoning for why we shouldn't do something, then, you know, it would be more reasonable. I don't want to get into that part too much, but other people have said I don't necessarily believe a lot of well, I appreciate your stick to witness. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Um, I guess I want to go more into your background. I'm trying to think about what type of person that we want here. And you heard me from Rock Warren Race here in such a Yes. You've been here 40 years. Yep. You love this community. Your kids are here. Yep. You started uh, two businesses already in town. Yep. Looking to start another. Worked at a bank to try to you know, give loans to other small businesses in town. Yep. Worked in the commercial fishing industry for helping the people of going to the property. You've taken college classes about the industry to learn about it, an industry that's based upon environmental benefits, economic benefits. Um, and yet it's been a struggle for years, and you're still here. It is a testament. The town of Citroën, you especially, that when I try to check off all the different marks that yourself and the folks that I'm seeing here um, check all of those marks, all of those marks. Uh, it's, it's it's amazing to see. I just want to say that. Thank you. Thank you for calling that out. You did a good job highlighting everything that he submitted to us. Say you're being shy. Um, I do have a question for you. Um, on your financial plan, you have the cost of here is five thousand. Does is that that doesn't include the boat that you're also? No, that doesn't. Okay. And those figures are pre-COVID numbers. Okay, that's fine. I haven't researched it a whole ton since, but I'm anticipating that. Okay. Like everything, it's done. And I do have a question. So I I feel you're taking a risk, but it seems like it's an educated one. Said that you trained under Jamie a little bit, and you've chosen a different system. Yeah, um, his site's a little bit very similar to this one from what I can go, but there's there's some the water's going to be a little deeper here. So I think that this for that reasoning, um, and, and like I said, I want to try both. I got a feeling that he his way is going to prove to be probably what works best. But well, the other platform that I think. I think we're, you know, I don't really want to speak to other guys, but I think that we'll have, from what I've gathered from other places where they where they do this, it's not always exactly the same in one town or even one body of water within a town. It's, you know, it's, it's nature, so you, you kind of got to adapt to what, you know, a lot. You know, so that's what I found to do. Thank you. Thank you. But just a few other, I'm just repeating what I said before, because I, again, just want to make sure you're aware of the risks. Um, again, pilot program risk. Again, it's going to get a run of, I would say, two to three years before anything got reconsidered, but that's there. The legal risk that you're getting involved in, you've already been through it, but I would expect it to continue. Right. Um, and then the, the transportation kind of risk of being able to get to the site before asset launch game, before asset engaging difficult at some point in time. Right. Um, especially if you do it by yourself, because you may not be able to leave your yeah, I don't, stuff there. I don't really plan on doing it myself. Yeah. Um, if there's days where I don't need help out on the farm, um, one of my other drivers, I think, would, I think would, would work it out where one of my other drivers could basically bring me in the boat over there, drop me off. They leave. Yeah, you'll work it out. Again, yeah. just one yeah. completely. I mean, you run two successful businesses, right? So I'm confident that you'll you'll run this thing well. And as Andrew mentioned, very impressed by the fact that you you've taken it educationally to the next level. And and you know, you didn't just read a magazine on it and say, "Hey, I want to do this," or saw 60 Minutes. You know, you went and spoke to people about the industry and running a business there, and that's you know shows that you're interested and, and you're going to. Work very hard to be successful. That's all I've got. Any other questions? 
Anything, I didn't open up to the audience the last time, but. Maybe I should have. Um, <laughs> on. I have a question. Just, I just need your name and address. Um, Nancy Roth, 1000 Grace Road. I want to know what happens at night on these sites. Are they marked in any way if someone's out in the boat? Um, they run into them. And My, second, um, what so is I'm gonna, I, okay, I'm going to open that. It's, that. These aren't questions specifically for Mike, so no, I mean, for everybody, yeah. but each person might have a different response. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. So you want to know how it's marked at night? And what was the second one? Winter. What's what remains in the water in the winter? Okay. Can you answer that? Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. So Mike, the mail show is possible. So outside of the growing areas of the farm, would be four corner points for white movies alerting people to not go into that area. There's no overwintering, so all the year pretty much comes out of there all winter. So the frames at the bottom? It all comes out. All, everything comes out of the wood. Okay. okay. So there's no lights on the corners. That's so my question. Perhaps a canoe yes. or a kayak, you just run right over the whole thing. You, you, uh, solar re reflective tape on the boat is smart in that. So it's solar, like similar, yes. similar to a navigational aid with red and green. So it'll be navigational aid, uh, uh, reflective tape on it, but no lights, and all the gear comes out in the winter. For everybody, Jamie, is that you guys? Yes, as well. That's the regulations. regulations. All the frames. And the, Everything. Into the, into the same. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Can we define winter? Yeah. That's <laughs> winter. That's just winter. Just winter. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. A couple of weeks. Does Susan, does the regulation um, state what the dates are? Or, or Jamie, what do you think? I thought it was January 1st, but I don't want to get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is Jamie still there? Jamie, when do you take the stuff out? Uh, that's the thing is that it's with climate change, it, it's changing. You know, I, we used to take it, uh, take stuff off. In um, mid to late December, but if the if the water is still warm and the oysters are still actively feeding, feeding, you're you're plucking them from their environment while they're still feeding, and they haven't had a chance to kind of gather up enough nutrients in their system to overwinter properly. Um, so it's it's pushing it into the first part of January. So that would be interesting to find. So when? But, so this is a weird one. So this year we so we didn't have our not this year. Out. This year's a so okay. Water so water. normal normal winter you take it out right around the first week of January. And then when do you put it back? Uh, first or second week in March, if possible. Sometimes a little later. Okay. So beginning of the year till beginning of March. <clears throat> so a couple of months. Ago. I saw one of them. So a couple of questions on. Uh, the usage of the, the bay. It was uh, mentioned that the sailboats on the sailing club don't use that area. Well, the, the larger sailboats don't use that area. The, the sailboating school, the young um, sailors, they do take their lessons in that bay and then they come up onto Basking's Beach, get off them for a little while, and then they go back out in that bay and they have sailboat races within that harbor area okay. so they do use that quite a bit and the other thing is uh, on employment uh, we mentioned that the young people would be able to be inducted into the uh, the business and a, a commercial venture i would think they have to be 18 years or old or older in order to be working on farm. I, yeah, if they're going to follow whatever the state regulations are, I think you can have your children work with you. What is it, 16, Mike? Is that what you're saying? So Mike says they're 16. Um, but I, they'll follow all of the regulations. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Beth and Brad, to the app. Um, just is the time that they'll be up there going to daylight hours? I'm sorry, say that again? Yeah, daylight hours. Yes. When they'll be working the farm? Yeah. I would assume. Is that the it's, a it's, right. a it's a state regulation. Yes, have Sunrise, half hour, hour. half hour before, half hour after. Okay. Thank you. Just not yeah. the question of the system. I just need your name and address. Heather Moses Heritage Trail. I just want to say, in third generation situated, and I applaud all of you coming forward with your businesses because we 
this is what Citizen is all about. We see so much development and business that it takes the culture away from this town, and you're bringing it back. So it's fun to say thank you, and I applaud all of you. Thank you. All right, let's go to the last applicant. Mike, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Seth, do you have a question? Or is that a different Seth? Uh, uh, no, it's, really no, it's not. It's like a little icon. <laughs> it's a shield. Uh, I'm you? Lawrence Strawbridge. Uh, I'm a second generation fisherman. <laughs> fisherman. Uh, I grew up lobster primarily. I went to school at Unity College for fisheries biology and aquaculture. Um, I actually saw a number of my friends get into aquaculture. Uh, it wasn't really available in our area, but they kept telling me to, you know, pursue it and try to get, get something going here. You know, and they've had successful farms down the Cape, Martha's Vineyard, and Maine. And I've, I also have a snappy lobster, so I'm a, uh, Paul Sale Seafood Distributor, and uh, I sell mostly direct from restaurants. So I've been buying oysters and have been out to the farms, and uh, you know, I've handled them. So as soon as I saw the uh, project get it started, I wanted to you know jump in. And, um, our lobster season now is being like reduced, and we really only have like six months to fish. So I thought it would be like perfect. Uh, in addition to, um, you know, I probably I already have a few hundred thousand dollars worth of equipment and uh, you know, boats and stuff ready that I can use for you know both operations. So I think it'll be a, a smooth transition for me, and I have uh, help already on the boats. And, uh, you know, I'm a licensed captain. And I'm familiar with the water area. You know, I went to an environmental school, so I, I, you know, I'm going to be a steward of the uh, area. That I always have. So. Tell us the, just a little bit more about any experience actually oyster farming. I mean, I've, I've never done it like for a job, but yeah. I've been out to the farms. So I've handled the oysters. I've seen the different cages. I'm friendly with uh, some of the uh, cage building companies, so you know, just. I'm, I'm real familiar. I mean, I know a lot of the guys down in Duxbury, and I knew the guys before they had started the project, like 20 years ago. And I still, you know, communicate, see how, where they come, you know, all over all this time. I mean, they have large farms yet, but eventually maybe, maybe here too. But I would, you know, all these concerns about, well, we're gonna run over the cages, what if we're out there on our kayaks? And I mean, originally in the plan, it said, you know, or in the proposal here, it says no floating cages. But to me, I think the floating cages <laughs> makes a lot of sense. I'm willing to do whatever cages, or, you know, that we're allowed to do, and I have all the, I, I already have downs on my boats, and multiple boats, so like, that'll be perfect for coming up there and doing it any which way but i think that that would be that would solve a lot of the uh issues with the navigation you know if you have a floating cage it's like there it is no, no. and it seems like a so minuscule of an area i mean out of 300 and something acres up there three acres where we're going to be in like a little corner of three acres it's like one percent of uh, the whole and i don't know if you've ever been up there on a boat but it's it's pretty big. I mean, when you're there, especially on a cold, windy day, you feel pretty isolated, far away. I never. I mean, I don't go up there. I mean, I've never seen it on a water skiing, but I've mean, heard of it. But uh, you know, most of the time, it's so low in there that boats don't really travel up up in there. And what kind of boat are you going to use? Your I mean, um, it depends what I can get in there, but. Uh, I mean, I do have a 36 foot lobster boat, which would be like a nice platform. And, uh, I have a Carolina skiff. I have a 24 foot uh, center console lobster boat. And then uh, I have my dad's lobster boat, about 36 foot lobster boat. So 
But I, we'll probably do our day to day on a 24 foot Carolina skip. That's just kind of like the industry standard. Um, we'll see how it, how it goes. But I mean, I have um, multiple more instances at Trinidad Harbor already. So I won't be displacing anybody or anything like that. I mean, I've had the Morins, I have a, um, a two floating docks. I have one floating dock and I have one that I use, uh, like, like store or you know, tie up to. And I'm a member and the president of the um, Lucia Russo um, docks, the lobster docks. And uh, I've been a member at the um, town pier for you know, a good part of my life, too. So. Um, you know, I am already paying my duty, so uh, people are familiar with me too. I won't be uh, in anyone's way, I don't think. Who'd like to start? Yeah. Can, I have a simple question. Given your background, what do you think the demand would be for a situate oysters, and should we brand them situate well, oysters? Yeah, I think it's a, it would be a good thing. That would be a good thing, yeah. So, I mean, I sell primarily to uh, restaurants in Boston, and I've probably sold to like over you know, close to 200 restaurants like in Massachusetts over the course of the last 15 years. And, uh, I also sell to restaurants like out in, uh, you know, on both coasts. I have friends that have restaurants in LA and uh, you know, Las Vegas, all over the place. But they are already interested. And uh, so, you know, as soon as we start producing that, you know, they'll buy, and that, uh, on a lot of re on a lot of menus at restaurants in Boston, you might see like a city of lobster. Well, that's I started telling the restaurants to put that on. Now you see that at a lot of restaurants and magazines and stuff. So they won't be wanting to say city of Boston and so forth. Nice to uh, I think it'll be fun. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I was going to note one of your references was, you know, exactly that notion to table on it. Frank's been working on some of that, and that speaks sort of to the macro, you know, people complaining that private business is going to profit, but, you know, the Economic Development Commission has seen that there's these add-ons that will, um, if done correctly, will benefit the whole community and, and to your point, reinforce our culture, which is, you know, Hard to measure that stuff, but it's pretty good stuff. Yeah, um, so you said you, your boats are you already have the orange yeah. in yeah. and you have your staff. Your back uh, your um, application, I unless I missed it, it didn't really have a financial projection. But so how are you financing your your startup? Costs? Um so I I have uh, you know uh, money of my own and I also have uh, you know someone that's willing to uh, you know help out. Financial, yeah, yeah. Uh, because as you know, Jamie was outlining this, you know, there's significant startup costs in yeah. multiple years. I feel like a lot return. of my, I have, I'm, I have, I'm a, I have a head stack right now. I believe you know, I have uh, refrigerated trucks, and boats, coolers, wire gear. I have, uh, I just built a barn to uh, build the cages and the bags, and everything's ready to go. So. Um, basically, my, my expense initially will be uh, cages. I think the converted in will be, uh, you know, like Jamie was saying, you know, start small and then like popcorn starts to, uh, yeah. And stuff. But as I expand, like, I can do it. I believe uh, the financial uh, the finances are there. So. Thank you. What, what's your sense? What's the health of commercial fishing now? And I say that it seems so many folks are overworked, underpaid, not respected. Yeah. You know, I had to deal with politicians over the years talking about both sides of their mouths. Yeah. I mean, it's it's been a tough battle for us. I mean, um, we're losing area and like space, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's to say. It's, it, we're up against a lot of things right now, the fishermen with like whales, and different uh, rules and regs. But overall, I mean, I think the stocks are as healthy as they've ever been my whole life. So um, we see more and more uh, 
life of all kinds, whether you know, lobster or fish, whales. I mean, I'm seeing things that I've never seen, sharks, and that I've never saw in my whole life, all of a sudden, the last maybe decade. It just seems very, it's probably a cycle, but, and management, maybe. I'll give them a little. <laughs> Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, how many cages do you intend on starting with? I didn't see that in your plan either. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess it'll, it'll depend, but probably I was thinking a couple hundred cages to get started. I mean, right now I fish 800 traps. So the numbers sound really big, but I don't think, you know, a few hundred cages is that many. But you know, obviously I'll have to see how I'm going to haul them or attend to them. And then decide. But I, I figure, like Jamie was saying, it's probably about a thousand oysters per cage. I'm trying to do this commercially, you know, so myself and a few others might be able to make some money. So, you know, it would be uh, probably by year three, I should have like 500 cages or so. You know. And then, secondly, um, what is it like for what percentage of your time do you dedicate to this piece of your business because you are an active loss from it? Yeah, I mean, um, I will probably find myself 100% of the time um, in the spring. I think the spring will be one of our busiest times because we'll be um, getting the cages and the seed all back up to the site. And right now, well, for instance, last year with our new rules lobster, and I didn't start lobster until like the 4th of July. So I basically have, yeah, I, uh, it'll, it'll be nice for me to have something to keep me busy for a few months there in the spring. And then we'll see how it goes, but I think in the fall, I'll, we'll harvest uh, more in the fall. We'll be tending in the summer, set up in the spring, and then in the summer I'll start getting busy lobster. But I mean, busy lobster, and I can still uh, visit the site at low tide and go lobster, and or vice versa, go lobster and then come in for low tide and then tend to the oysters. So I mean, I'll basically be there, uh, you know, every day. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to for you. Yeah, um, I should have asked this of Mike. Um, do you have a fear going into this at all? Um, you know, the only fear for me is, I mean, getting to the site is going to be our biggest challenge, I think, because, you know, uh, it's never, it, it's been really windy. The last like few years, it's windy every day. So like, you're gonna need a, a decent, I, I'll be able to get up there, you know, I have safety stuff on my boat, I have all that. But like, if Mike or Jamie, they're trying to get up there in a Carolina skiff or, the wind picks up while we're out there. I mean, it's going to be hard to, to get get home. With very limited uh, windows of days that you can go come and go, especially if you're you know throwing thirty cages on the boat and trying to get up there, and then the wind picks up or it's windy before you leave. So that's going to be our biggest challenge. But I mean, I'm not afraid of that. But I think that's what I'm most concerned. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I just know that. I said go lobster every day, but it's not every day because it's just too windy. If it's too windy to go lobster, it's definitely too windy to uh, try to get out there. But I mean, we'll see. I don't know. I mean, maybe we can use Parker half for our skiffs and, uh, and then be a lot more accessible. But most of my plan is to use like the Situ Town Pier or Situ Harbor. So load and offload, you know. Let me do it that way. My operation will be a lot like the lobster operation. But it'll just be oysters and cages instead of lobsters. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm just going to repeat what I, you know, the, the kind of the risks that you're aware of. Yeah. Pilot, pilot program, there's probably going to be some legal stuff that happens potentially. Yeah. And then um, you, know, you mentioned a bit of a high gate to the site. You, you may have some challenges there. Yeah. Um, so, just in summarizing, I think our three applicants are um, all qualified in different areas, right? We've got, we've got a guy that does it, 
we've got a, fish, a successful fisherman, and we've got a guy that studied how to do it and is, you know, is a local uh, local person who runs, runs small businesses. So I think it's a really interesting mix of the three of you. I hope the three of you collaborate and help each other make it successful. You know, that's I think that's going to be a key to, to the program. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I've known Mike for a good part of our lives, so we're, we're friendly. And uh, Jamie, you know, I met him probably before the, uh, and we're friends, but yeah, before the project had started, we met him on the kids' game, basketball games or something. And we got to talk and we hit it off. And as this evolved, we caught back up. And yeah, I mean, I, I have a feeling Jamie will be able to help us with the oysters themselves, the oyster. I might be able to help with uh, navigating so, or, or boats. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In the hustle. <laughs> and does the board have any other questions? I'll open up the audience one last time if there's any other questions while we have three candidates still in the room. If you're on Zoom, just raise your hand. All right, seeing none. Um, thank you guys for coming in. Are we, um, we going to vote it this evening? There's a motion before you with that. Um, I just didn't see it. Susan, Mike, anything else? Any last comments? Good. Thank you for getting on the process. I think it worked very well. Just one point yeah. of clarification. So, just to circle back to what Susan said at the beginning. So, should this board approve these um, applications, the next step is that they get forwarded to DMF. Correct. And they go through their process. Right. And how long is that process typically take? Do you have any idea? Um. Um, how long does the MF process take? Well, they would have to, to do the site survey, um, they need um, warm enough water to put the doctors in. So uh -huh. that the, it's, it's hard to say. So when the water's warm enough for divers to go overboard, they're going to um, do an official survey of the site. And then it also has to go through some other processes. So it could be as quick as a couple months or maybe, maybe two to four months. So those are so the fast site and the applicants. They will, yes. And well, we you're sent, we'd send the information from the public hearing um, and the vote and whatnot to them. Okay. Yeah. And then the, oh, the conservation. There's a couple other steps, like with um, local with Concom con conservation and um, MECA and a couple other steps. But these are considered very small. <laughs> A small scale, so DMF handles the process. They actually have a pilot program that fast tracks the smaller um, applications. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Any other questions? If not, I'll take a motion. <coughs> uh, for preliminary, uh, pre preliminary approval, I can't say, of three aquaculture grants and to request the Shellfish Advisory Committee <coughs> move applications to the Division of Marine Fisheries for final approval. <clears throat> Second by Mr. Goodrich. Further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Favors five to zero. Congratulations and good luck to the rest of the process. Right, I think that's our only topic for this evening. So, um, anything else to come in that we can watch? We have to close. Yes. We have to close ours. Yes. Do you want to close your motion to adjourn at eight fifty-seven? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Adam said aye too. Um, and how about it? Can I have a motion? We need to end the public hearing first. Yes. Yeah, sure. uh, motion to end the public hearing at eight fifty-nine p.m. Second. Second by Ms. Conley for the discussion. Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Can I have a motion to adjourn? I'm signing documents at that point. Second by Canfield for the discussion. Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.